Special guests, starting with the past presidents of this society, again, Kevin Murphy, cameraman, <laughs> Gloria Novak, <laughs> and of course, Scott Sellers. In addition, we have John Novak, past president of the East Alliance Club. Yeah. And Laurie Finland, the president of the East Lady Lions. Yeah. And Victor Storino, Steel Workers Union president. Yeah. And since the theme today is literary societies and all that, we have a few, I would say, luminaries in our audience, authors. Starting with Michael Boos and Bill Fisher, who is represented by a sister, and Kathy Fitzgerald, and of course, Carolyn Mulek, and Kevin Murphy again, he's a popular guy. And Rod Sellers again, too. And Rob Stanley. Has a few books for sale here, just as a reminder. <laughs> bought a book, okay, good. But you sold one book, Rob. <laughs> okay, now we have arrived at the uh, most important part of our gathering. The reason for today's get-together, the Southeast Chicago Historic Society Installation of Officers for the year 2014-2015. To perform the installation ceremony, we would like you to welcome Felicia Starden. Felicia is one of the youngest school electors in our area. She's the daughter of Rosario and Leo Starden, who have been the owners of the Grizzle Humanist Staten Funeral Home on Ewing Avenue. Please welcome Felicia. The treasurer receives all monies and disperses funds according to the rules of the society. She shall keep an accurate record and shall preserve such accounts. Financial status report will be made at all meetings. The Office of Treasurer requires, above all, accuracy and integrity. May I introduce Gloria Novak, Secretary. The Secretary will be responsible for taking accurate accounts of meetings necessary correspondence, and preserve accounts as required. May I introduce Rob Stanley, Vice President. The Vice President will preside at all regular and special meetings and assume the various duties of the President in his absence. It gives me pleasure to introduce Barney Janecki, President. The President shall preside at all general meetings and 
and shall serve ex officio on all committees. It is the duty of the president to guide the historical society in each and all of its endeavors. Are you willing and ready to assume office? On behalf of the members of the South Chicago Historical Society, I declare that you are duly installed. Congratulations. Thank you, Felicia. So next, we'll have a few words from our new president. Bye. A few words. <laughs> Can I be heard? Yes. yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank the membership for their support in re-electing me president. I can't believe that I have been with the museum since I retired, which has been 20 years ago. As they say, time flies when you're having fun. This job is made much easier with a strong supporting cast. Thanks to Gloria Novak and Carol Mulek, our true and honest treasurer. I want to thank Joanne Posco from Murphy and her husband Kevin, uh, who has been adding his expertise to our museum. I must mention Jim Osterello and Clarence, who doesn't happen to be with us today, for their contributions. Rob Stanley, our new vice president, has been a frequent visitor to the museum of recent days since he retired. He will be a big asset. I must mention Rod Sellers, who is the anchor of our organization. Rod is a humble person, so I will say he is the one that really gives our society uh, and museum the recognition that it gets. He does admirable work and should be commended for it. Thanks, Rod. He always seems to be in demand by a lot of people for historical knowledge. A greater number of our members are lifetime members, so we should continue to prosper and grow. We have signed up a number of people who have come to the museum seeking information, and then we talked to them taught them into becoming new members before they leave. Christine Wally, formerly of the East Side and now as a professor at MIT, formerly known as Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Everyone has heard of that prestigious school. She is the author of Exit Zero. Under her auspices at MIT, a grant was awarded by the National Endowment of the Humanities. Now that society is working together uh, with the MIT grant to develop plans for the preserving and digitizing of some of our collections at the museum. It will make possible for many more people to make use of the materials which we have. We will be able to use some of the grant money to make purchases such as a scanner, which we recently arrived or have received. We also are looking to update our present computer, which has become adequated by today's standards. However, we will use our own fund for um, for that purchase. We try to keep updated, keep you updated on how we are involved in community activities such as the lakeside development. It will take us uh, several years before it is completed, but things are starting to move. A new park is already open on the site of 87th Street entrance. A 10-foot sculpture will be erected at the site depicting a steel worker and his family. A dedication is planned for the Labor Day weekend, uh, September 6th and 7th. Please join us for this event. Uh, in conjunction, plans are being made for the society to have a tent set up to display some of our artifacts. We may be asking our members to help with this event. We will keep you posted with more information in our next newsletter. Uh, I mentioned Christine Wally in the book Exit Zero. In today's presentation, Rod will tell us more on that book and others that relate to the Southeast Side. Uh, next year's uh, presentation will cover the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, which ended August the 20th. Uh, a number of you may remember that happy occasion. Uh, one little note that I can tell you now is when we got word of the news, a few of us teenagers went to the 83rd Street 
uh, IC station, caught the train there, uh, got off at Randall Street, walked to State Street, and whooped and hollered with thousands of other people. That was quite a, an event. Later in the year, we may ask you to participate in telling your story or bringing in articles relating to World War II. Uh, we try to run a tight ship when it comes to money, so we are in the process of getting a permit from the post office to reduce our cost in mailing the newsletter. Carolyn uh, filled out the necessary forms at the downtown post office and got some information. Uh, once we are approved, we will determine if it will be cost effective uh, for us to use the permit. Remember, working with the government doesn't necessarily work to your advantage. Uh, thank you now, and I want to turn over the program to Barney. Uh, Kevin. A point uh, with respect to the lakeside development. Several meetings have been held that have, have dealt with the planning and also with some of the artworks and things of that sort at the park itself. Uh, we have all that on YouTube. We have videos of those complete meetings and stuff like that. So if anyone's interested, you can find that on our YouTube site. If anybody wants the address, I can give it to you later. But we do have that. We've recorded a lot of what's been going on there. members of our society. Perhaps you don't remember some of them, and then again you may be surprised at their names. Lucy Damari, oh. she was one who used to sing at the beginning of our meeting. Uh, Teresa Enoch, who worked for the Chamber of Commerce Office. Uh, Geraldine Gorazon, and Lorraine Turp. <coughs> God saw that they were getting tired, and it sure was not to be. So he put his arms around them and whispered, come with me. With tearful eyes, we watched them suffer and saw them fade. Although we loved them dearly, we could not make them stay. A loving heart stopped beating, hardworking hands to rest. God broke our hearts to prove to us the only thing to the best. Congratulations to the new officers. I know they had a hard campaign obtaining these officers. <laughs> Every year they go through this electioneering process. So congratulations, you made it. Anyhow, back to our former program. Those of you who attended our dinners in the past few years, remember the interesting, informative, and fascinating presentations on our area's history by master historian Rod Sellers. Well, I'm happy to say that Rod, again, has prepared another great presentation to thrill you and delight you. Rod Sellers. Uh, Al forgot to say that we're going to need five minutes to set up. We need five minutes to set up. <laughs> Okay, um, <laughs> okay, I can't use the mic because it's way over there, but I think I have a big enough mouth. Um, we, um, we started a number of years ago, instead of hiring barbershop quartets and harmonic cats, etc. Uh, since this is a historical society, we thought it was an opportunity for uh, ongoing education in the history of the southeast side, so we picked annual themes. And this year our theme is the literary southeast side. And what we mean by that is that the southeast side has become a, a subject matter. It, and people use the southeast side and use the area for subject matter. They use it for settings, in particular books and works of literature. Um, one of the things, and, and it's really our main reason for being uh, in the museum at Calumet Park, is that we are 
a source of information, especially historical pictures. And then, of course, there are a number of scribes. I, authors is easier to understand, but it doesn't, you know, then it's only three S's in the name. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So, um, But it's people who have written. And I want to start out by saying that this is not a 100% comprehensive program. There are things that I skip. In fact, as I was pulling out books to bring for display the other day at the museum, I, I forgot about that. I forgot about that. So uh, sorry for the omissions. Mike Boos, I forgot to add your book. Uh, we need to get a copy at the museum, by the way, so that those things won't happen. But we're going to look at a series of books that have been done, uh, and we're going to we're going to look at them chronologically so they they fit into those those different categories. Um, one of the early books is a book by Elizabeth Cohn. Uh, as you can see, Cambridge University Press, kind of you know high academic hoi polloi type thing. But uh, she did a book about industrial workers and used a number of photographs from our collection. And uh, that's the cover of the book, and there is a copy of it back there. Um, and this is a picture that comes from the Southeast Chicago Historical Collection, uh, the Southeast Chicago Historical Project. That was the uh, project done by Columbia College. Uh, these are other pictures. Um, and one of the things that gets very interesting about the pictures that are used from our collections is that you will see certain pictures coming up again and again um, for whatever reason. They're just that type of a picture that somebody who's doing a book figures that that you know, kind of tells the story uh, better than anything else. Uh, but these pictures, again, you will see various times. Uh, the one in the top left is a cow in a field in South Deering. It first appeared in a 1926 dissertation from the University of Chicago. The one on the right top is uh, Croatian Falcons, uh, an ethnic group. The picture in front of the A&P store is actually in Hegwish during the Depression. Lower left-hand side is another Hegwish picture at uh, Press Steel in Hegwish. And right-hand side is a picture with a warning sign in several languages that was taken at U.S. Steel. This actually appeared in a documentary film uh, about Polish immigration and they're obviously, I mean if you look at it, and to me those are obviously steel workers or rail workers and they were identified as Polish woodworkers in the documentary. <laughs> you know that happens with pictures when they don't have identifications. Another very important book done about the area was done by Dominic Pasiga. Uh, Dominic as a young graduate a postgraduate student ended up working with the Southeast Chicago Historical Project, went on to become a professor at Columbia College in Chicago. He spent the last year in Poland teaching. He'll be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, this is the cover of his original, of the original book. It has been released again, uh, and it's, it's about Polish workers, and he, he concentrates on the stockyards and the steel mills. We don't have much on the stockyards, but we got lots on the steel mills. And I probably recognize the church on the right hand side, that's St. Michael's uh, at 83rd and South Shore Drive. These are other pictures. Um, again, these pictures come up in a lot of different books. Uh, the one on the top left is an employment office at Illinois Steel. It's got a warning sign, six different languages, um, none of which is Spanish. And which is, which is a, a view of what was going on at the time. Uh, right hand side, first four blast furnaces, the southwards. Uh, bottom left is a, uh, I think it was Dolotowski, but it was a, a store in the bush. And right hand side is from that uh, 1826 or 1926 dissertation, uh, and it's, it's kids playing in the bush, the alley as a playground. <laughs> um, another, uh, again, this, this is from Dominic's book, which focuses on the Polish. Uh, that's a house uh, from the bush where a family had lived for four generations. The other two pictures are from the dissertation on housing conditions. It was actually housing conditions in South Chicago, South Deering, and Pullman. 
Uh, another book, and this one's a little different. Uh, it's written by a guy named Louis Rosen, who's actually a songwriter and a composer in New York. Very well known, uh, made most of his um, fame in the music industry, but he wrote a book about growing up on the south side of Chicago in, uh, during a time of racial change. Uh, Louis is actually a former student of mine at oh Bowen High School. Uh, that's a picture of Louis, and that's a picture of his book. And it's uh, it's not a, it's not a picture book, so there's there's no pictures in it. And what it is is, uh, it's a composite. It's a story based on interviews with people, but none of the people in the book are identified. They they're given uh, anonymous names. But if you know the neighborhood, you know who's talking for the most part. Uh, some of them are composites. But that, this basically, you know, it's about racial transportation or transformation. And Louis, um, Louis often describes himself as the last white basketball player from Bowen High School. <laughs> um, and, and good athlete, uh, nice guy, excellent musician, comes back to Chicago a couple of times a year, usually does a show up on the north side. Uh, he's actually got a musical program based on this book. Uh, mostly with songs that he composed. Okay. Where did he grow up? Um, he grew up in the area of uh, Pill Hill, Pill. near Pill Hill. Um, this book we're not going to even bother with because there's just tons of pictures and they're all over the place and you're all probably familiar with it. But uh, it's a book that I did in conjunction with Dominic DeSiga uh, with Arcadia Publishing. And there are several books that I'm going to look at today uh, that come from Arcadia which is a publisher that does historical, um, historical photography. That's the cover of our book, and you might recognize that picture. <coughs> it's that same picture that was used oh, in, uh, in that other book. I got that. Good. Okay. Wait a minute, that should be handed. Why are we going down? Whoops. <laughs> Our computers. You ever had this trouble with slideshows? <laughs> um, now, this is a, a book done by a local author. Uh, it's not a local book, so to speak. It is set in the myth in a place called Lackenby that if you said might be the east side, you might not be too far off. Okay, there you go. Straight from the author's mouth. Uh, there's a local book, and it's it's a it's a novel, not a picture book. That's a brief description. We want to just give you enough to entice you to purchase the book and take it home and read it. Um, our, the first book that we did uh, about the Southeast Side was very successful, so very shortly thereafter the publisher was interested in the second book and we did it. And Although I hate the title, that's what they do when they do second books. Uh, they just say revisit it. I don't know what would happen if you did a third book. <laughs> Re yeah, re <laughs> yeah. uh, that's a picture actually taken in front of a store in Haywish. An interesting thing about that picture, if you look at the original picture, it's actually flipped horizontally. But because the picture wraps around the cover and goes to the back cover, we have flipped the picture uh, to make it work. Another book that we contributed a lot to uh, by Rita. Arias Juracek, Carlos Tortolero, both of whom spent some time at Bowen High School. They were my teachers. Uh, Rita went on to uh, work for Thornwood, Thornton, one of the one of the South suburban schools. Carlos went on to uh, become the president of the Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum, which is now known by another name. I have trouble remembering these new names. It's like banks and companies that change names. National Museum of Mexican Art. That's it. Thank you very much. I was screwed up. Um, but they did a book on the Mexican community in Chicago and got a number of pictures from our collection, um, most of which come from a particular part of our collection called the Cordero Collection. And this, this is uh, the, the, the gentleman on the right, lower right-hand side there and his wife, it's his wedding picture. Uh, Justine Cordero was an avid photographer who documented the Mexican community. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of times, various ethnic groups, it's hard to get information. You know, they, people didn't record it. People didn't keep it, didn't save it. 
But uh, this is a, just a great collection. Uh, the top picture is a uh, dedication of Our Lady Guadalupe. Uh, right hand side is the, the finished church. And you have Cordero's uh, wedding picture. Uh, the picture on the left is not a Cordero picture, but it's very interesting because it's, uh, it's from Carnegie, Illinois Steel, which was one of the names of U.S. Steel during its years. Uh, but you can take a look, and although it doesn't tell you exactly when the picture was taken and when this woman would have been working there, but if she was born in 1900, it's fairly early. And these are other pictures related to the Mexican community. Uh, that was a, a band that played at a lot of activities. Uh, the Gaiety, which of course started as a uh, neighborhood movie theater and during the last years of its existence was showing Spanish language films. Uh, and on the bottom, a couple of pictures of uh, sports teams from the uh, South Chicago community. And they become a very important topic for many uh, documentarians and writers. Um, a fellow by the name of Jim Klukowski. Uh, Jim's a member. I'm kind of surprised not to see him here today. He must have had something else going on. Uh, but Jim was a uh, photography major, um, went to Columbia College and worked with the Southeast Chicago Project as a student. And uh, he did a number, he did a book, he did a, he's done a couple of books. One of them was uh, White Sox in 1991. And, I don't remember all of them, but uh, he's done some picture books. And uh, this is the cover of his book. We have a copy of it here. Uh, that's Commercial Avenue. Uh, the, the top picture is looking north. That's Immaculate Conception in the background. And that's kind of a, a, a weird picture because uh, the lens that they use kind of compresses things. So I mean, that almost looks like Immaculate Conception and the commercial theater are right next to each other. And of course, if you grew up in the area, you know that's not true. But that's what photography does. And the other picture is from Immaculate Conception Bell Tower looking south towards the east side. I had to look that up because that picture really threw me. <laughs> These are some of the images that, uh, that, were, that are used by Jim in his book. Uh, the top one is a map from the Southeast Chicago Project. It was actually done by Joe Mulek, who is a former president. And uh, a few people here who knew Joe. Uh, and the, uh, the one on the right-hand side is the intersection of 92nd and Commercial in about 1934. If you're looking west in that view. One on the bottom is uh, the Letterer store, which was at 91st and Commercial. Letterer was bought out by Goldblatt's, who very quickly tore it down and built a brand new store. And it's interesting, the, the Goldblatt's that they built was a three-story building, and it was so popular that within two or three years, they built two more stories onto that building. Um, somebody doing a documentary just identified that as the Goldblatt's store, I had to correct that. Uh, and then the, the one on the right is the uh, New York store, that's actually down here, that's the South Chicago Bank. That's on 92nd Street. Other pictures that uh, Jim used, uh, top left is 92nd Street Bridge that's looking towards South Chicago. Right hand side is a uh, open house at U.S. Steel. Uh, I believe that's a night, and I, I believe it's 1947, they had a huge open house there. Uh, lower left hand side picture Jim used, I also used it in one of our books, uh, it's the South Chicago Hotel. Uh, which offered a buffet, as you can see, and offered liquor, and second floor, you can see they offered a few other things. <laughs> what, 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 was it, what address was that? Uh, that was on 92nd, just west of Commercial. Uh, we've got a picture that shows the Columbus Monument in South Chicago looking east, and you can see this building. You can see the other side of this building uh, from, from that viewpoint. Is that where cars would have been? Uh, no, cars would have been on the right-hand side. This would have been on the uh, southwest corner of Commercial, southwest. and this view is basically looking west. Um, the fellow on the right bottom is James H. Bowen. What are we on, 91st? Did you say 91st or 92nd? 91st. This is 92nd. Columbus Monument's on 92nd. Yeah, I know where. Yeah. And and the other picture 
uh, looking. Well, that would have been where the Fannie Mae was? No, this would have been where uh, the bank is. Oh, the other corner. Okay. Okay. All right, book called The Pied Piper of South Shore. Technically, you know, we don't do South Shore. We end at 79th Street, but uh, this particular book, uh, th there was a poster done for the book. The book is about We Folks, which was uh, a store on 79th Street yeah. near South Chicago. Um, the woman who wrote the book, the, it's a story of her growing up in the area. Her father was a victim of a murder. Uh, by a gang member, uh, and she wrote the book, The Pied Piper of South Shore, about her father. Uh, but then the, 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 the artwork for the book, the poster, done by a guy named Mitch Markovich, uh, who does a lot of South Shore posters, newer South Shore posters, like shows the Avalon Theater on 79th Street. Is it actually where the store was across yeah, from the Avalon? So almost it's, directly it's, across. It's, it's, right. Correct. Which is technically not, that's South Shore, not, yeah. But, yeah. That's uh, a little, you know, just a brief description of what happened. Uh, she sends out, actually, she sends out quite a lengthy newsletter. Uh, it focuses mainly on South Shore, but every once in a while she gets into uh, the this, this South Chicago area. Did you know that they're close as Okay, along the Calumet River, another book by the Arcadia Group. Uh, written by Cynthia Ogorek, who uh, has become a regular visitor to our museum on Thursdays because she's doing research for a book on Haguish. Uh, this particular book talks uh, about the main branch of the Calumet River, but also the Grand Calumet and the Little Calumet. Uh, we don't do much with those two branches of the river. Uh, and here are some pictures. And again, you see that that picture of the first four blast furnaces to U.S. Steel comes up being used. Uh, that's actually an 1885 picture. Uh, right hand side at the top is an aerial view of Southworks kind of during its prime. A uh, picture in the middle is uh, U.S. Rolling Stock, which was a railroad car manufacturer that was located in Hagwish. Uh, lower left hand side, interesting picture showing the construction of the Skyway. They're almost finished, and they hope that it meets. <laughs> uh, right hand side, another picture of uh, a boat that actually uh, destroyed a bridge across the Calumet River at 97th Street. This is uh, kind of a, uh, one of my favorite books, uh, done in 2007, uh, about Polish Chicago, very colorful book. And it, it's interesting because it's history and recipes. We've got a copy of it back there. And if you're looking for some good Polish recipes, it's a good book for it. We didn't furnish any of the recipes. We just furnished pictures. And they dealt with the history. Uh, top left is a picture of a fire which occurred in the bush, I believe, 1919. There were five or six homes that were destroyed in that fire. We have a whole series of pictures uh, about that incident. Another picture of St. Michael's, uh, lower left-hand side, bottom, uh, that's uh, St. Hedwig's, which is a uh, Polish Catholic church in Anguish. And right-hand side, those are actually my aunts uh, during World War II. You'll see this picture again next year when we do our World War II program. Um, my family my, on my mother's side is Polish, so I, I've used family pictures for various sources of information. Here's a couple more. Uh, you saw the one on the left before, kids playing in the alley. Mm -hmm. uh, the one on the right is a very, this happens to be my grandfather, grandmother, and their first, I think, five, four, one, two, three, looks like five kids. They ended up having 11 eventually. But their first five kids, but we have probably, I'll bet, six or eight pictures like this in the museum of families posed on their new car. You know, and it, this happens to be a Model T, which you could order in any color as long as it was black. Uh, but this was a big thing for a family, to buy their first car. And so you took the pictures. Lower left-hand side was the first family house, which they owned, on 85th in Baltimore, which they lost during the Depression. Again, very common story. Right-hand side is a uh, Polish wedding celebration in South Chicago. You can actually see Saint uh, or Immaculate Conception 
in the background. Mm -hmm. Uh, top left hand side, this is from that 1926 dissertation. Uh, you see the picture of the Illinois Steel Employment Office once again. Mm -hmm. An aerial of U.S. Steel and a uh, very common picture. We've seen this in, we've got several copies of this in different places um, of the Illinois Steel <coughs> Company, noon hour. This would have been at uh, 89th Street entrance. <coughs> Again, see the picture you recognize? Mm -hmm. um, right hand side, uh, early safety mask <coughs> at U.S. Steel. Uh, left hand lower side was a machine shop uh, with, a, with a number of people. And then again, another picture of the Polish store from the bush. And what would <coughs> stories of the southeast yeah. side be without stories of taverns? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, several of those, very important. Um, Top right is a picture of a World War I uh, Red Cross trade in Hegwish. Lower left hand side is the Polish singing group. And right hand bottom is John Shibalewski, uh the Swede. I don't get it, but that's what the, that was his name and that's what they called him. That was his bar in South Chicago. Uh, picture of Commercial Avenue looking south from about 87th Street. Immaculate Conception in the background on the right hand side. Uh, so it's a short book and you know we've got a few of these that sneak in. They're, they're not academics, they're not professional writers, they're you know the average guy who just decides to put his thoughts down on paper. And this is a book about the community. I just hope that in a uh, Doesn't show a publisher because it's self-published. And uh, those of you who are interested in doing a book, nowadays self-publishing is much easier than it used to be. But this is the book, um, and it's a story of growing up around Rainbow Beach. Third Coast, there's a, an author who has been in a museum several times by the name of Ted McClellan. Uh, Third Coast was his first um, experience coming into our museum, and uh, it's about the Great Lakes and what he did was he, he told the story of the Great Lakes starting on the east side and then going out towards the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, this is a picture he just posted on his uh, Facebook page uh, and he's a north sider uh, and he posted this picture which of course is taken near 95th Street. Those are the bridges at about 97 in the background and he caught all kinds of flack from his north side friends. <laughs> Yep. That's right. uh, but this is about, you know, this is about the, the book. Uh, it, it, for example, talks about, you know, the days when the uh, southeast side was still a place where world ships came in, international ships came in, and they had rooming houses for some of these people. Uh, when he came into the museum, and I, I just, I can't forget this, uh, he was looking for information about Siemens bars. Places where these guys would get off the boats and they'd drink. And he wanted to know if we had any information about Horse Face Marys or Peckerhead Kates. <laughs> and then a, a few years later, I saw a Facebook question that asked if we knew anything about Marys on Green Bay Avenue near Southworth. And I didn't quite know how to say, would you mean Horse Face Marys? I, we just kind of ignored that question. Green community, a little bit different. This is, this came out of an exhibit uh, at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. And they uh, used a couple of our photographs uh, taken around Wolf Lake. And then after the exhibit, the exhibit was on for about a year. I never did get to go see it. I wanted to, but never made it. Uh, those are some of the pictures that they used in the exhibit. And then they published a follow-up book called Green Community. Some of those yeah. Uh, Kevin Murphy, uh, another book, Out of Order. Um, we don't have the book here, but we have a photograph of the cover. Um, we hit the southeast side again. Yep. Okay. <laughs> to the that. point. To the point that when we were doing a discussion of it with the book group over in the library. 
one of them was really upset because she found out that the restaurant that was described there in the community that was really in intriguing her was fictional. Yeah. Well, I wanted to go eat at that fictional restaurant. Yes, she restaurant. did. She wanted to go. Tell her she'd have a fictional meal at the fictional restaurant. Uh, this is a little bit more information about uh, other things that Kevin has written. Um, Unfriendly Fire, uh, notable for its historical content because it relates to the Memorial Day Massacre. And uh, I'm sure Kevin agrees, but I, we're still waiting for the video that was taken of that. That's a sore point, yeah. Uh, with, there was a video taken, but somehow disappeared. It's kind of like the old Bonner you know? it, it never disappeared, right? That we don't know if it was ever real, if it ever happened. Yeah. yeah. There were many cameras set up to do it, and we were promised a copy from that group that was doing it, and we're still waiting, and it's, what, 13 years later, 12 right. years later? I don't know how it works. If, if an author comes in to take pictures that you have, is there, do you get paid for that, or is it... Yeah, you get we, credit probably in the book for, for sure. We, we always ask for credit. Okay. Uh, depending on the use, we typically do charge a fee. Okay. Uh, whether it's a book or a documentary, we're actually working with a couple of documentaries now. Uh, we do charge a fee if it's a non-profit group. I mean, it's kind of yeah. at our discretion. But at some time you are compensated for We are compensated okay. for use of our pictures, okay. yes. Not a lot. Carolyn can give you all the details. Uh, this is a kind of an interesting book. Uh, this author is from Acadia University in Canada, Nova Scotia. You know, how the heck did an author in Acadia University get interested in the southeast side of Chicago? But he did a book on the Memorial Day Massacre. Uh, we gave him all kinds of pictures, but his book ends up with one picture, and it's on the cover, although we have a ton of pictures on Memorial Day Massacre. But it's, a, it's an interesting book. It's, it's one of the few books that gives almost a step-by-step -step discussion of what happens uh, in the moments leading up to the massacre. He or, actually borrowed, well, he borrowed nothing. He got a copy, we gave him a copy of the play when he was doing his research. Right, and he, he visited, and we went out and walked the site uh, although there's not much left, uh, it was one of the things that he did. And that's, that's the cover from the book. Another book in the Arcadia series, Croatians of Chicago. Uh, author came into the museum and uh, used a number of our photographs. Croatian falcons show up again, that yeah. picture. Yeah. picture on the bottom left shows up. picture on the right is interesting. Uh, Slovansky Harvatsky Dom <laughs> meant that they catered to Slovenians and Croatians, and it was a it was a tavern. But it, but most taverns at that time were also rooming houses. So you know it was very common for immigrants who came over. The father would come first, you know, find a place, live as cheaply as possible, and then after he got a few bucks together, would send back for the rest of the family. Um, other pictures from that same book. And again, I, you start to see again some of these pictures. Like it just—it surprised me how many times these same pictures come up. Uh, another book by Edward Ted McClellan, uh, young Mr. Obama, uh, actually just kind of touches a little bit on our area. It's more so uh, with Obama's years as a community organizer in Altfeld all Gardens. Studio Gang Architects uh, did a book about some of the things they put together. Jeannie Gang is one of the real up-and-coming, that she's probably arrived, I don't know if I should oh, say yeah. up-and-coming, uh, one of the top architects in Chicago. Uh, she did that uh, Wave apartment building in downtown, and she had come up with a design for uh, an environmental center in Hagwish, uh, which apparently is never going to be built. Uh, but she did a book about their firm and their ideas, and uh, that's those are the covers. And that the picture there, the top picture is actually the construction of the Hagwish trolley line in 1915 across what we call the swamps. Now we call them wetlands. Um, and then that's a picture of the design that she did for the Calumet Environmental Center. Uh, she also did some pro bono work 
when we were talking about uh, setting up a museum at the Acme Coal Plant. So the top picture there is the uh, entryway with the guard tower, or the, the, uh, ed, the guard uh, building. Uh, right hand side is the top of the coke ovens, and the left hand side is the bottom of the quench tower. And these are her designs for what could be done there. So you could go get a coke on the coke oven. <laughs> I'll flip that back so you can kind of take a sort of a before and more like what it looks like now and then after. And of course, that other project that kind of helps me. And then this is here because it's a local office. Because no way am I going to have to use this book. <laughs> this is a book for reference librarians. So <laughs> probably not on the top seller list uh, published by the American Library Association, but published by our treasurer, Carolyn. Terrorist Next Door, interesting book. Uh, Sheldon Siegel grew up in the area but moved out uh, when he was fairly young. He's in San Francisco now. He's a lawyer and an author, and he specializes in mysteries. Uh, he's done probably six different mysteries, uh, feature a couple of characters, Mike Haley and Rosie Fernandez, I think are their names. Uh, but he was interested in doing a book set in Chicago, and he came back to Chicago, and he and I went out for about four hours on an afternoon, and we, I gave him a grand tour, and two years later he sent me the text for a book called The Terrorist Next Door. And as you can see, it's set in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, just a couple of, you know, a couple of things. I mean, it's the main characters, Bowen High School grad, uh, St. Francis is mentioned, Bowen High School, uh, the Bush Commercial Avenue. Uh, second one from the bottom is really important, a reporter from the Daily Kelly Met named Rod Sellers. <laughs> and, and that's about as, as much a mention as Rod Sellers as there is in the book. Uh, and then the, the, the book comes to a head at the synagogue on Houston Avenue yep. in Chicago. It's a very well written, easy to read book. And this is another one of those um, kind of uh, vignettes of what it's like to grow up in the area. Georgia Nijak Kraft grew up in the area, um, kind of the area around Wolf Park on the east side. And she uh, talks about growing up in the area. She's got some great descriptions of uh, what it was like to go to a Catholic school with nuns. <laughs> um, it, it's a novel, you know, not a lot of pictures. It's several family pictures. Uh, we worked with her on the introduction uh, because uh, it's kind of setting the scene of the east side of the Calumet River and uh, helped her make sure that everything was straight. Uh, South Shore Railroad, another book done by Cynthia, uh, and another Arcadia book. Uh, that's the cover, top right, that's the uh, old uh, metro station or South Shore station in Anguish. Uh, left, lower left is the old, old uh, South Shore Railroad station and that's the South Shore Railroad Bridge. Uh, recently just uh, received a book of Frank Perez, a guy who he and his wife have come in the museum uh, several times within recent months. Uh, it's a self-published book, and it's, it is his story. A very interesting book, very easy read. Um, but you can do this if you want. This is uh, another interesting book, and, and I think you can see the variety of ways that people use the community, use our resources uh, to do things. Uh, Clyde Davis basically is a genealogist. This is a genealogy of his family. But there's a copy of it back there, and it's, it's really an amazing book. This guy put together a book that's about three inches thick, uh, high quality print, photographs, documents, etc. Had it published himself, he, he took a trip out to China to have it published in China and uh, donated a couple of uh, copies of the book to us. He used a few pictures, not a lot, because he he covers his whole family, both sides, going way back. Uh, that's actually a picture of the Trumbull Park housing projects. 
and that's a picture of 106 then Torrance looking south. <coughs> ah, once upon a time in South Chicago by our new vice president. Um, interesting book. I mean, I really liked it because these are the guys I grew up with. Uh, and it's, it's, it's stories, you know, about growing up in the area. Uh, this is a local football team called the Bonnevers. Some of the, there, there's a story of every one of those guys is worth a story. Oh, especially him. <laughs> um, these are some pictures that were used in the book. Uh, top left hand side, it's a picture of the 1929 Bonnevers. I mean, they've been around for a long time. Top right hand side, it's a picture taken inside Indiana State Prison, which was one of the teams he used to play uh, in that league. I always thought that was unfair because they always play home games. <laughs> uh, lower left hand side is uh, George Gizmo, who owned uh, Gizmo's Tavern on 94th and Ewing. Again, source of many, many stories. Oh. Many of which can't be told in public. Uh, and then bottom right hand side is the uh, Bonnevers 1970. A uh, picture of the Memorial Day Massacre, mm -hmm. uh, which occurred on the east side. A uh, picture of a mill, typical mill uh, oh, yeah, in the yeah. area. And then the right hand side is uh, what used to be a tavern, uh, Frank King's Tavern, uh, which is now. Yeah, Fast food place. Mm -hmm. It was Crawl Stavern, didn't it? What? Wasn't that Crawl Stavern? It was Crawl, right. Yeah. And I think it probably was Crawl's originally and then the King, Frank King said. Uh, I think Crawl. Uh, the Crawl was, was King. Translated as King. That's right. right. Was, and, and Crawl just, just passed basically. Right. right. He used to run the Tavern. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Rob's book uh, covers not only growing up on the east side, but his experiences in Vietnam. And uh, there was a Vietnam connection with a young man from Hagwish, uh, Carmel Harvey, who uh, received the Congressional Medal of Honor during Vietnam, a uh, graduate of Washington High School. Olive Harvey. Olive Harvey is a yeah, combination of uh, Carmel Harvey and Milton Olive, who was another uh, KIA. These are some comments about Once Upon a Time in South Chicago. Uh, I think the best comment there is uh, the third one. Holy shit, what a terrific book. <laughs> that kind of says it all. Uh, very, very down to earth. It guaranteed to make you laugh. And, and brought back tons of memories. Uh, by the way, here's another local who I skipped. Okay, Pascal Marco. Uh, is from the east side, lives out west now. Uh, close friends with Sheldon Siegel, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, he's another east sider. Uh, Identity Lost is a novel. And there's other novelists, uh, Sarah Paretsky, you know, who wrote mysteries and used settings on the southeast side. Um, Guy Izzy, Eugene, right? Eugene, Eugene Izzy from Hegwish, uh, who did several books, and he was a local. And this is uh, Ed McClellan's latest book, Nothing But Blue Skies, which talks about kind of a very hot topic recently, which is deindustrialization. I mean, two years ago, that wasn't even a word. Uh, Exit Zero by Christine Wally. Uh, and we are, I'm sure, going to be working very closely with Christine uh, during the next year and hopefully uh, beyond that uh, because of the grant we received. Uh, with MIT, uh, it's a grant to kind of look at our collections and come up with a plan. And if uh, NEH likes our plan, we'll go ahead with that into further years. Uh, it's called Exit Zero, and there is actually an Exit Zero. Yes, there is. Uh, at the end of the go-away. Um, and this is kind of an interesting map that shows up in the, uh, in the book. Done by somebody, not from the area, but it's pretty accurate find any mistakes. Of course, Chris knows the area very well. And uh, here again, you've got, you know, again, repeat Sorry. pictures, but some of those pictures are what, when I was teaching, I used to call them powerful pictures. You know, they kind of tell a story just by themselves. This is one of my favorites. It's actually from the Press Steel plant in Hague, which uh, had a bond rally in World War I. 
probably a dozen versions of that, steel mills at night. That's a great picture of Wisconsin Steel after it closed. Um, this picture again of the uh, English trolley. Uh, another book recently released, Steel Barrio, uh, Michael Innes Jimenez. Um, I found this book to be very interesting because it's, it's the story of the Mexican community in South Chicago, written by a guy, I forgot where he was born, but it was in Chicago. Uh, and he teaches now at the University of Alabama. Mm -hmm. And he did a book on the Mexican community in South Chicago. Did it good job. <laughs> There's actually a picture on the cover there in the middle from our collection. A little hard to tell. But... And then these are other photos. Again, all four of these photos come from our Cordero collection. That's the old Our Lady of Guadalupe, originally located in a... Uh, Army Quonset hut. Uh, the reason was that the priest at Our Lady Guadalupe had a connection with the military. There again is Cordero's wedding picture, and he had from a uh, Spanish language newspaper, and a couple of pictures of the baseball teams. And again, the sports were really important in all the Southeast Side communities, but uh, particularly in Mexican communities. There's actually, this is, this is another one of those weird connections that you get. A guy from California who's doing books on Mexican baseball in California has contacted us because he likes to put in a couple of pictures of other communities where baseball was important. So he, you know, so he, he's done four books and in three or two, in two of them, I don't think the fourth one's out yet. Uh, in two of them, he has used pictures from our collection. I mean, it's kind of weird. You look at this Orange County, and here's South Chicago. But I guess somehow it makes sense. Now, that's pretty much it on books. And again, I apologize if I left your favorite author out. This is not meant to be totally 100% uh, inclusive. But we also work with people who are doing documentaries. Uh, Wrapped in Steel was a video done in conjunction with the Southeast Chicago Historical Project. You want to see it? It's on YouTube. All 90 minutes. <laughs> but it's it's an interesting view, and it gets even more interesting as time goes on because it's a look back. You know, I mean, what? We're almost 20 years. No, 30, almost 30 years. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, almost 30 years. That was not a <laughs> uh, the evolving county map was done for a local environmental group, uh, SEPA, in 2004, uh, by Chris Babel, who is Chris Wally's husband. She's an author. He's a videographer. Uh, Mike Stellato was a student at Columbia College who did a program on fallen giants, which talks about the decline of the steel industry. Fourth Partition, released last fall by uh, Adrian Provica, Rafael Mascala, uh, it's about Polish immigration to Chicago. And there's about a 15, 20 minute section specifically on South Chicago. Uh, works still in production. You never know with videos because you'll talk to people and you'll help them out and you'll give them photographs. And all of a sudden, two years later, they say, oh, the video's done. You know, because you just don't know how long it's going to take. But uh, Chris Babel is working on a uh, documentary uh, that goes kind of in line with Exit Zero, the story of the closing Wisconsin Steel. Cowboys of the Sky is actually about the iron workers in Chicago. Specifically, and you might know the name, uh, a guy named Rukavina. I think George was his name, but he was one of the real famous iron workers in Chicago. He was there when they topped out Sears Tower. You know, he's the guy up there with the antenna. Uh, and South Chicago in Progress. This one, I've actually seen uh, a rough cut, and this guy is looking to do some showings this summer. Uh, and it's about South Chicago, but specifically South Chicago and Lakeside, and the uh, kind of conflict between the community and the company and what's going on with that. We've also helped with magazine articles, students coming in doing research projects. Kind of an interesting story. In the Southeast Project collection, we have 
90, 95% of what was given to them, but every once in a while there's something missing. And for years, there has been a dissertation from 1926 on housing conditions in the area missing. And a young man came in from the University of Chicago, we gave him some information, helped him with sources, and mentioned this project. And he had access to the USC library, and two days later he said, here, I got a copy of this, this dissertation that you've been missing. So it was kind of neat that we were able to plug in that missing piece. Uh, we deal with newspaper reporters all the time. Uh, in fact, just two days ago, uh, the, New York, the Indiana Times is doing a series, uh, or is doing a couple of articles on the U505 at the museum, which is there for 70 years. And we had a collection of photographs uh, from Great Lakes Dredge and Dock when they moved the U505 from 92nd Street to Lakeshore Drive. And they are hoping, they want to use a couple of those photographs in the paper. So keep your eyes open. If you get a copy, hang on to it for us, because I live in the boonies and I don't get it to Indiana. Uh, and then every once in a while, we'll get a television radio program. Uh, six months ago, uh, we got a call from uh, Chicago Tonight. They were doing something on Pill Hill. And they wanted, you know, they had some questions about Pill Hill. So we, our main uh, purpose in life is to be a resource for people. And with that, any questions? Okay, uh, any, anything, question is anything with expanding the museum? Um, no. Uh, the, the basic problem is we don't pay rent, we don't pay utilities, we don't pay for security. The only thing we have had to pay for in the last couple of years, uh, and we reluctantly agreed, was liability insurance for the park. Um, the collection is not insured, but it's not really in danger. Um, problem, you know, the problem becomes even if someone were to, someone were to come up to us and say, here's a building. It's gone. You're it's gone. then going to have to pick up upkeep and utilities and all that kind of stuff. So it's just, it's, it's a tough situation. Now, it is becoming more and more difficult to function in the space we have because, I mean, Thursdays, it's like a trap. It's one big traffic jam in there. You know, we have four or five volunteers, four or five visitors. You can't move. Right now, we're at the point where we have stacked things. So if you're looking for one item, you may have to move three items to get to it. Uh, so, I don't know, we're, you know, one of, the, one of the solutions to that, we hope, is this project with MIT where we start to digitize more things. So that you don't physically have to come in to see things, you can access them online. And is the reason you're open one day a week because of the volunteers? It's more than anything else. Oh, yeah. We don't, we can't get out. <laughs> And we're, and we're also pushing now for air conditioning. We have air conditioning that we got, but it's dwindling. It's not giving us the cool air. And we have a lot of documents we want to keep cool. So let it get hot. Yeah, literally, I mean, we have, part of this grant is to bring in a professional archivist to look at our collection and make recommendations. And I, you know, I, I was a little bit leery that we, I had my first meeting with the archivist a week and a half ago, and I was a little bit leery that as soon as she saw what we had, she just kind of hit the trail and run out the door and say, I'll see you later, you know. Uh, it, it's one of those things, but I'm sure she can come up with some ideas. But temperature and humidity control, which are so important for archives, uh, is a problem for us. We have two small window air conditioners, which may or may not work, depending on the weather. You know, so. Any other questions? Well, we are open on Thursdays 1 to 4. Come and visit us. And if you have any historical items, we'd love to have them. I mean, we, you know, every week we get some, uh, we, we tend to get interesting donations. If not, you guys can go watch the hockey game and have a great afternoon. What's the score? 2 nothing Hawks. Thank you. Yeah. Oh,